All right. Good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for an update from Israel Investment Advisors on Israel, its response to COVID-19, and its future growth prospects. My name is Joseph Friedman, Director of Business Development and Investor Relations at Israel Investment Advisors, and I'm joined today by Brian Friedman, no relation, same great last name, uh, President, Co-Founder, and Principal and Portfolio Managers here at Israel Investment Advisors. We're speaking to you today from our respective homes in Denver, Colorado, and like many of you are under order to shelter at home. We know this is a challenging and uncertain time for many. Many of us have friends and family members who are struggling. We wish you and your families our sincerest blessings for health and wellness in this uncertain time. Our audience today is made of a mixed group of individuals, some of who are familiar with Israel Investment Advisors and some who are not yet familiar. Allow me to take a few moments just to describe what we do here at Israel Investment Advisors, LLC. We're a Denver, Colorado-based subsidiary of GHP Investment Advisors, one of Colorado's largest wealth managers. Since its inception in 2010, IIA has been the premier vehicle for U.S. accredited individual investors, foundations, and endowments to invest in the Israeli stock market. We provide a vehicle for those individuals and organizations with pro-Israel values to align their investments with Israel and participate in the long-term growth of the Israeli economy. In the time we have together today, we'll provide an update on the pandemic in Israel, the current economic state of Israel, the government's response to the pandemic, and the long-term growth prospects of the modern Israeli economy. After that, we'll take some time to answer any questions you may have. Please type all your questions into the Q&A box in the bottom of your screen. We can not promise we'll get to all of your questions, but we'll do our very best to answer the most pertinent ones in the allotted time we have. We'll also be engaging you all, the participants, with polling questions. Please answer it on your screen and we'll do, the share to, do our best to share those answers with you. So with that, again, thank you so much for being here and I'd like to hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Brian Friedman. Thank you, Joseph. Um, welcome to uh, our Israel Investment Advisors webinar. We have been adjusting to this form of communication. I would prefer to see many of your faces, but I hope all of you are doing well. And if you have any questions, feel free to uh, write them in the Q&A box. I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about the details of Israel's COVID-19 response, but we will touch on a few items and then dive right into how it impacts the Israeli economy and the financial markets. Firstly, it's important to know that the United States actually experienced its first COVID-19 case in late January. Israel, however, did not experience its first case until February 21st, when one of the Diamond Princess cruise passengers landed in Israel and um, unfortunately brought the disease uh, for the first time. Now, when the US had its first case, we did, President Trump imposed travel restrictions from China. Israel, however, the day that, they, that the first COVID-19 case appeared, immediately halted all international travel except for returning Israelis. That began what uh, early on seemed like quite draconian restrictive practices that Israel has been well ahead of the curve in imposing. And many people in Israel early on were suspicious that perhaps the Israeli government's response and Prime Minister Netanyahu's response was either politically motivated or maybe motivated uh, as a way to distract from his court cases. We aren't going to comment on his motivation, but what I would say, the lesson that has been drawn from Israel's uh, early reaction and its intensive reaction is that it has been true to Israel's security principles of preemption and um, what some of its detractors might call disproportionate response. For those of us who are in the pro-Israel community, we might take heart from what the COVID-19 response has been in Israel, 
Because as it turns out, the entire world, ultimately when faced with a similar risk to lives in their country, has so far um, responded with the same preemption and the same disproportionate response that the situation calls for. We won't get too much into the details that you see below, but we will discuss how they impact the Israeli economy in just a minute. Because we're investors in the Israeli stock market, it's important to note that we just experienced our worst quarter ever in the almost 11 years that we've been managing the Israel Investment Fund. And we have quite a few investors on our webinar today. Please note that although this is our worst quarter for the Israel Investment Fund, this uh, chart shows that the performance of the Israeli market has essentially tracked the S&P 500 as well as other global equity markets. It was not necessarily the case that because Israel's response was early, dramatic, and disproportionate, at least in its early phases, that its markets experienced a more dramatic decline. In fact, the decline has been very similar to other countries like the United States that have reacted more slowly with less dramatic action in the early weeks. If you can advance the slide, thank you. What I thought we would do is try to quantify and discuss the impact on the Israeli economy, but also use as examples a few Israeli companies that are in our portfolio to discuss what the short-term and long-term impacts will be. Before I go into some of the individual stories, let me discuss a little bit of how we've been um, forecasting and how we've been trying to analyze the Israeli broader economic situation. Many people, when, we when they start to analyze gross domestic product of a country, the total amount of goods and services that a country's economy produces, they tend to think of that number on an annual basis. So for example, in 2019, Israel produced $375 billion of gross domestic product or GDP. That 375 billion, however, when you divide by an average of 365 days in a year, implies an average of $1 billion per day in daily GDP. Until this crisis, it was not necessary to estimate the impact or the fluctuations of GDP on a daily basis. However, at Israel Investment Advisors, we have gone through the gross domestic uh, product reports for the state of Israel, industry by industry, sector by sector, to estimate what we think the impact is on a daily basis to GDP. In the early days, when Israel first imposed its travel restrictions, our estimate was that daily GDP had fallen by about 5%. Um, as the, uh, the uh, restrictive measures began to escalate, and we came to the point of a almost near closure of all face-to-face -face business in Israel, the decline in daily GDP began to accelerate. Up until late March, we estimate that daily GDP in Israel had fallen by about 15%. That was because Israel as a very strong export economy was still able to maintain those strong exports while the United States, Europe, and much of Asia remained open for business. As the United States and Europe, in particular, began to close down in the third week of March, second and third week of March, Israeli GDP on a daily basis began to tr uh, trend downward further. Right now, we believe daily GDP in Israel 
is running about 25 to 30 percent below what it was before the closures began. That is roughly in sync with the daily reduction in GDP currently in the United States and in Europe. Whenever you close down face-to-face -face business in the way that modern industrialized economies have closed down face-to-face -face business, you are going to see dramatic declines in gross domestic product, and there will be significant impact on uh, business. Now, with that said, that impact is not the same for all businesses and for all industries. So we thought, if you don't mind, Amy, just go back to that chart um, showing the three companies. Thank you. Let's use these three companies, Electra Limited, Nice Systems, and Fatal Holdings, to talk a little bit about what the short-term impact is and what the long-term opportunity, we believe, still is for these companies, as well as for the Israeli economy as a whole. For those of you who have tuned in from Israel, you will most likely be familiar with all three names, but most certainly you'll be familiar with Electra Limited and Fatal Holdings. They are very prominent brands and very large companies in Israel. Electra Limited is an electrical contractor, primarily in the HVAC area, air conditioning. It's about a $2 billion company in terms of revenue. And I'm going to use uh, dollars, if that's okay, for most people in the audience, uh, because that's the currency unit most familiar and how most of our audience thinks. Uh, so for the Israelis, I apologize, but we'll keep most of it in dollars for the time being. Electra Limited, um, so far, has seen very modest impact to its business. Much of what's going on in the construction area in Israel relates to residential construction, which was deemed an essential industry by the government. Ironically, even though there has been reductions in labor force, particularly for workers coming from Asia, places like China, uh, productivity of those workers in many ways has actually improved since there's nobody on the streets in Israel to block their trucks or delivery of materials. What I want to say about Electra, their stock has fallen in synchronization with the entire market. And as I mentioned, the entire market has fallen in synchronization with the global markets. But the opportunity facing Electra, as well as the construction industry as a whole, particularly residential construction in Israel, remains intact despite the daily reduction in GDP in the short term. We probably should have another call on this subject that I'm about to mention all by itself. But for those of you tuning in from Israel, you're already familiar with what the government calls Pinui Binui and Tama 38. Suffice it to say, without getting too deep into the details for our American audience, there is a major wave of urban redevelopment uh, of already underway in Israel. We are in the very early days. And for those of you who are in, uh, involved as investors or analysts or observers of Startup Nation, all the startup and high tech uh, activity that goes on in Israel, of which we'll talk about in a minute, the construction industry dwarfs the high tech industry both in terms of its contribution to GDP, as well as um, its, uh, the number of jobs that it creates. And the opportunity in that industry is quite large. It's many decades long as we start to redevelop many of those old buildings, particularly the old residential buildings that were built in the socialist era in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, those buildings will either be torn down in the Pinui Binui urban redevelopment process and replaced with brand new high rise towers, as is happening now, or the low rise buildings will be refurbished through what's called the Tama 38 uh, process. Electra is a major, major player in that field, 
And there are many tens of thousands of buildings yet to be redeveloped that will be going from either no air conditioning or uh, HVAC to large scale centralized HVAC, let alone all of the commercial and um, infrastructure opportunities for the most major electrical contractor in Israel like Electra. Nice systems, some of you may be familiar with this. They are one of the dominant software companies in the call center space. Once again, their share price has fallen in complete synchronization with the Israeli market and the American market and the global market. Nonetheless, they are the engine, the software driver behind all of the call center activity and contact center activity, which we are now relying on for all of our remote transactions. And that includes voice transactions when you call your bank to discuss your credit card, but it also includes other interactions such as those that you have through the bank's app on your phone. NICE is one of the top players in this field. And I suspect despite the decline in its uh, share price, that it will in the future continue to generate significant revenue growth as it has in the past. Right now, it's about a one and a half billion dollar revenue company. So once again, I mentioned that I would talk about the startup nation. We at Israel Investment Advisors do not invest in startups. We invest in what we prefer to call scale ups. That's what the stock market does. It provides large scale capital so that smaller companies, whether they're a startup or just a smaller company, can raise the kind of capital necessary to scale up in the way that a nice systems has to one and a half billion in revenue and maybe even much, much larger. The same is true for Electra Limited. Um, nice systems, of course, at one time was a startup, but we are not interested in companies that are startups until they are substantial publicly traded and profitable, and hopefully remain profitable throughout much of the crisis that we are now dealing with. Then finally, I wanna talk about one of our holdings that is a, turning out to be a major error. Fatal Holdings is one of the larger hotel chains in Israel. Fortunately, we were not heavily invested in the hotel industry. Uh, because the hotel industry was experiencing robust demand. Israel had just received uh, last year four and a half million foreign tourists, a record. Hotel occupancy was very high, hotel profits were very high. And as you know from our own experience here in the United States, but even more dramatically in Israel, hotel occupancy went from very high levels to almost nothing overnight. Fatal is in the direct line of fire for that situation. It's a tale of three companies that are reflective of a bigger story in Israel. The short-term shutdown is creating problems for all three. However, for direct face-to-face -face businesses like Fatal, it's creating potentially uh, catastrophic problems that threaten the viability of its core business. But for the overwhelming majority of our portfolio, it looks more similar to what you see with Electra and Nice and not very much like Fatal. And that has to do with our philosophy, which is we buy profitable companies with uh, modest debt, strong opportunities, but also without extensively high fixed costs. And that's why I view Fatal as one of our errors. Go ahead and advance the slide. So that's the short-term situation. Israel is facing dramatic declines in GDP, as is the rest of the world. The, the reason that we've started to think about this story in terms of daily GDP is, of course, because hopefully the closures and the restrictions that all of us all around the world, but most particularly in Israel, where those restrictions are quite a bit more uh, severe than we are experiencing here in the United States, hopefully those restrictions will be counted in days and months or at most quarters and not years. Because any economy, 
including the Israeli economy, cannot sustain 20 to 30 percent reductions in its GDP for more than a reasonably short period of time. Now, because Israel entered this crisis with such robust fundamentals, I want to talk a little bit about where it began before we get into what's going on now and what the plan will be uh, to recover. Firstly, Israel has, or did have, one of the fastest growing developed economies in the world. GDP growth has averaged 3.4 to 3.5% for almost two decades. The underlying fundamentals of that growth, we believe, over the long run, are still intact, and we'll discuss why in a minute. Before the crisis erupted, Israel reported record low unemployment, 3.4% and record low interest rates. Now, because of the closures, because face-to-face -face business has been restricted, Israel has now reported two unemployment uh, rate statistics since the closures began. At present, their unemployment rate went from 3.4% about a month to six weeks ago to 24% today. There are now more than 1 million Israelis out of work. That is unfortunately a harbinger of the type of news that we are going to see coming to us here in the United States in the, in the coming weeks. Israel is a modern, industrialized, high-tech economy but even in an economy like Israel's that's modern and high tech, there is still a great deal of face-to-face -face business. There are still the waitresses, the waiters. There are the people working in the tourist sector, the hotels, hospitality, and all of those people are finding themselves out of work. So let's talk a little bit about, number one, what is Israel doing to address the problem? And then some interesting silver linings that have appeared in recent times. Sorry, let me just go back one, one chart. We're coordinating this. I hope it's going well from various locations, including the advancement of our chart. So uh, bear with us. OK, as I said, Israeli GDP is now running 30% below its $375 billion level, or its $1 billion per day level. And just like in the United States, in order to prevent economic calamity, uh, Israel is in the process of enacting its own rescue and relief package, which will amount to about $22 billion, or 6% of Israeli uh, pre-crisis GDP. In order to do that, the um, Oops, sorry, Amy, keep going back if you don't mind. I don't know what's going on with our charts. Thank you. Um, in order to do that, they are uh, enacting a variety of policies, which Amy wants to get to, and I promise we will. Um, but before we get there, I want you to know that there are some interesting things that have flowed from what Israel needs to do in order to finance this rescue and relief package. Yesterday, Israel issued $5 billion of Israeli government bonds, the equivalent of US treasuries. For those of you in the United States who are familiar with the Israel bonds program, you might be surprised to learn that the overwhelming majority of Israeli government debt today is auctioned through uh, often global markets in the exact same way that United States treasuries are auctioned. But yesterday, there was a very interesting and historic auction because Israel has a very high credit rating, double A minus coming into this uh, crisis, and very low debt. In fact, the Israeli debt to GDP ratio is 60% substantially, almost 20 percentage points lower than the debt to GDP ratio in the United States. 
In order to finance this rescue package, the Israeli Treasury will need to issue more than $22 billion in debt due to the reduction in tax revenue, due to the reduction in the economy, and the need to finance whatever timeframe is required for their quarantine policies. Now, getting back to what happened yesterday, Israel issued three sets of bonds. One of the bonds was a 100-year bond, meaning that, and it was issued to international investors. These are not people who are necessarily motivated by a love for Israel. They are not necessarily Zionists. In fact, they are all global institutional investors who believe that the, that the state of Israel will still be around 100 years from now to pay the loan back. And they charged only 4.75% interest for that 100 year loan. For those of you out there who have repeatedly asked us over the years, well, isn't there significant risk to investing in Israel because of Israel's security situation? Of course, I'm sure there is. However, there are very few countries on earth and they include places like Canada and Israel, uh, Canada and Australia, and now Israel, that have issued a 100 year bond at what would be considered quite a low interest rate for any investor taking a bet over the coming century. Keep that in the back of your mind when thinking about the riskiness of, of investing in Israel as a country. There are people out there willing to hold 30 year bonds and even 100 year bonds at quite modest rates of interest. Now, let's talk a little bit about what the current situation means for the Israeli stock market. The Israeli stock market has historically traded at a lower valuation than the US stock market and many other global markets. There are not that many international investors like us involved in the Israeli stock market. By the way, there are many international investors involved in both the government bond market for Israel, as well as the corporate bond market for Israel, which has largely been a function of falling interest rates all over the world, and Israel's very attractive credit rating and low debt profile. In the equity markets, this sell-off which from peak to trough approached about 34%, plus a little bit of a bounce in the last couple of weeks, um, means that the Israeli stock market is currently selling at about uh, seven times cash flow, down from eight and a half times cash flow. One of the reasons we like to look at it from a cash flow uh, perspective is that we care about cash flow. We care that companies produce profits and we care that those profits are cash. That's our investment philosophy. Once again, there is no knock on startup investing, which many people associate with uh, the Israeli investment landscape, but startups by definition are unprofitable and their revenues and profits will typically come many years into the future. What we are interested in are companies that are earning profits and cash flow today. Before this crisis began, the Israeli stock market as measured by the Tel Aviv 125 index was selling for what was already a low eight and a half times cash flow. And it's gone even lower to about seven times cash flow, which is about half the value of the United States. Go ahead. In the interest of time, because we promised that this would be about a half hour, I'll wrap up by saying that Israel has uh, enacted a similar rescue and relief package, or they're about to enact, uh, to the United States. And basically it rests on two principles, fiscal uh, support for unemployed workers and idled businesses, as well as some payment risk sharing amongst various people, including landlords and tenants, forbearance on loans and mortgages, things of that nature. The details, which are on the next slide, 
um, are somewhat different and tailored to the structure of those payments, the structure of the Israeli economy, but in essence, rest on the same principles that uh, the, the similar package here in the United States rests on. Go ahead and advance the slide. Many of you often ask, what has, uh, when we think about risk in the Israeli stock market, um, what about all of the security and geopolitical conflict that Israel is subject to? And I wanna thank some of our listeners today from Blue Star Global Indexes for sharing this chart. It really displays that actually, over the last 25 or 30 years, almost every major stock market decline in Israel was related to a global financial event, like the global financial crisis, the current coronavirus crisis, uh, the tech, uh, technology bubble popping, et cetera. Very little of Israel's uh, market activity is related to the brown dots, which are security events or armed conflict. Uh, and we can probably have a whole webinar on that subject, but we can do that at a later date. All right, finally, Israel is well positioned for future growth. We're gonna post a few uh, polling questions. Feel free to answer them. We'd love to see your thoughts. But Israel has grown three and a half percent a year, roughly over the last couple of decades. Some of the reason why is obvious to see. Israel has one of the highest population growth rates in the world. They've implemented policies to facilitate restructuring and reform that uh, advances productivity in their economy. And despite the current crisis, we believe that those fundamentals remain intact for the long-term future. Israel's low debt rate will allow it to borrow what it needs to plug the gap for the current short-term crisis. But the long-term fundamentals remain intact and viable and are on a very strong foundation in the coming years and are now selling at quite low valuations in the Israeli stock market. And then finally, if you can advance just a couple. There you go, keep going. I don't want to negate the technology sector. I wanna end by saying, Israel is one of the most innovative countries in the world. It's one of the most resilient countries in the world. All of us are familiar with those stories on this call. We probably do not need to rehash them, but here's a global chart showing R&D spending by country. The startup activity in Israel is robust. Technological innovation continues apace. And many of those startup countries, uh, companies coming out of the startup nation will grow and seek financing in the public stock markets, just like NICE Systems has done over the years and many, many others. And when they do, those are the opportunities that we are looking for in our portfolios at Israel Investment Advisors. Thank you, Brian. Um, that was really, really timely and, and uh, interesting. I uh, just want to say we, we tried sending polling questions to the audience. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties. We do, however, we've got over 50 people on the call today, which is fantastic. And we've gotten lots of questions, the majority of which are from uh, those folks in the tri-state area. So I guess it's true what they say about people in New York. They're uh, they're a little louder than the rest, but I did also want to say to everyone uh, calling in from the tri-state area, we know things have been tough there and uh, our, our thoughts and blessings for uh, that things get easier there quickly. I'm going to start, uh, Brian, with the first question from uh, Greg in New Jersey. Well, political here, but that's okay. It's reported that Prime Minister Netanyahu recently instituted a power grab as part of the country's pandemic management. How will this reduction in citizens' rights and increase in government's power affect Israel's economy, markets, business, and capital markets? Um, thanks for that question. Let me just say, I apologize. Um, I've always been accused of being a little long-winded, so I did go a few minutes over. And I'll continue answering questions. Anybody that uh, wants to sign off, we're thrilled that you joined us and made a half hour available. Maybe next time 
because I am long-winded, we'll schedule 45 minutes or maybe even an hour, but then I'd probably fill up the time. But to answer some of the questions, and I'm happy to stay around uh, uh, and answer most of them, I don't wanna get too deep into politics, but what I would say is uh, in the very early days, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu did act quickly and forcefully and well ahead of the remainder of the industrialized democratic world. And um, only China up until that point had imposed significant restrictions. And around the same time, Korea began to impose its significant restrictions. And so many people, because of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's legal battles, assumed that he was seizing this crisis for his own political benefit because nobody else in the world had followed suit. Um, I don't know if he did that or if he did not do that. Um, I don't know why he would not do that. However, subsequent events have um, revealed that he's not alone in the world. So that's the lesson I take away from this, not so much uh, should we point a finger at Prime Minister Netanyahu, should we get into too much political debate, but Israel has a strong, long history of dealing with threats preemptively and in a way that some others might view as uh, disproportionate. And I think that one of the lessons I take away from this is Israel's enemies and detractors should realize that even if it's a virus that attacks, Israel will follow the exact same security strategy that it does with other threats to lives in Israel. And, um, and so will every other country on earth, certainly every other advanced economy. And uh, for those of us who do care about Israel's global reputation, it's probably worth repeating what happened in this episode uh, and put it into that global context. That's my only political commentary for the program. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next question from Doug in New York. Uh, I like this question. Is there a compelling reason why the stock market in Israel will rebound faster than the one in the US? Well, um, what I would say is there's a lot of unknowns in this coronavirus situation. Number one, we don't know if all of the closure policies that Israel imposed or the closure policies that we are now experiencing around the United States, we don't really know what the ultimate impact on the trajectory of the pandemic will be. Um, some commentators and some people, even in Israel's uh, health ministry, think that it can be contained early. And there are others around the world, as well as in Israel, that think some of the infection, that, that eventually the infection will spread to large segments of the population in an inevitable way. So I would tell you, much depends on the disease. However, those countries like Israel that enter this period with enough government financial firepower to uh, ride out whatever policy choices are required will ultimately, I believe, rebound faster and do better, number one. Number two, we didn't even get into the whole conversation about Israel was better prepared for this kind of crisis than almost every country on earth. It has tremendous hospital surge capacity. There are entire hospitals uh, in Israel. I have uh, somebody on this call, in fact, works heavily with certain hospitals that can flip overnight if under attack by missiles from above ground to underground. There are a variety of scenarios that Israel has already prepared for in terms of mass casualty events. Israel is better prepared in many, many ways for this type of crisis than most other countries around the world. You have to believe that that would lend itself to a faster economic rebound because what it does is it gives Israel the capacity uh, to lift many of its economic restrictions sooner when it becomes clear that they have the capacity to handle the influx into their hospitals. In Israel, they're having the same debate that we are in the US. 
Why weren't they better prepared? Why didn't they have more masks? Why didn't they? But in many, many ways, Israel, in fact, did have a plan that they pulled right off the shelf. It was labeled, perhaps, uh, it was probably in the notebook labeled Hezbollah rocket attack. But nonetheless, they had a plan and they're implementing it right now. Good, thank you, Brian. And uh, some of you may see the polls coming up on your screen. Feel free to answer them. We'll try and share those results with you as they come up. Our uh, next question is from Steve uh, in New York. How is your portfolio position going into February and how are you positioned now? Great question. So one of the things that you have to know about Israel Investment Advisors we are long-term investors, and we strongly believe that in order to survive a hurricane, the way you do this is to build a strong house in the first place. What do I mean by that? When we look at companies in our portfolio, it's very important that they have strong profits, that they exhibit profit stability, meaning that maybe in a recession, their margin declines a bit, but nonetheless, they remain profitable. We like uh, companies that have strong balance sheets, meaning enough cash to weather storms and modest debt, uh, so that if they have to borrow during a time like this, they won't be overly burdened. And in particular, we don't like companies that have very high fixed costs as part of their operating structure. And we particularly do not like companies with high fixed costs and high debt. So in our portfolio, the overwhelming majority of uh, companies fit that bill. And when they do not, and uh, like the example I, wrote, I uh, mentioned, Fatal, I could almost kick myself, apropos uh, Warren Buffett, when I get possessed by some sort of demon to invest in a company with somewhat higher fixed cost and higher debt, almost always a crisis comes along to remind me of how stupid that really is. So other than Fatal and maybe one other company. You're so hard on yourself, Brian. What's that? Yes, I well, very hard on we have a strategy and I'm being open and honest. And for the most part of the 45 stocks that we own in our portfolio, 43 fit that bill and two do not, Fatal, the other one in full disclosure is uh, Delek. They're the ones that own the offshore rights to uh, the natural gas fields in Israel. And um, we won't even get into a discussion today, but of course the price of even liquefied natural gas around the world has collapsed. So those are the two big bummers in the portfolio right now. But we try to avoid those situations uh, when properly following our own discipline. So not much has changed in the portfolio pre-crisis to post-crisis, other than there are many, many, many very inexpensive stocks in the Israeli market right now. So um, I think we'll end uh, with this last question from Harry in Denver. Um, and I, I think I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Um, I think what Harry was was getting at is how would you compare Israel's long-term bond offering and what they uh, they could charge for their 100-year debt versus that of some other countries, maybe in Europe or you know Europe or or uh, the Americas? Yeah, great question. So um, there's not that many countries out there that have 100-year debt, and Israel does pay a little bit more because they're uh, typically very high-quality AAA um, countries. Uh, I um, I don't want to waste anybody's time because I forgot to write down the interest rate paid on the 10 and 30 year tranches of this most recent bond offering. But um, Israel, I believe that 10, the 30 year was at a 2.75%, something in that neighborhood. Maybe that was the 10 year, I apologize. Either way, the 10 and 30 year offerings are at interest rates that are low by historical standards. They are very low when compared to other countries that would be considered emerging markets, but they are higher than the United States and much of Europe, the UK, the Eurozone, because many, many of those countries at the moment 
uh, have negative interest rates, which is a whole other conversation about what, is, what are negative interest rates and what does that mean? So Israel is paying higher interest rates and Israel is a small country. Um, the reality is if it was located in Europe instead of the Middle East, it would have most likely a triple A credit rating rather than a double A minus because it has such low debt relative to its economy. Its interest rates are so low, so therefore easy to service. And as a result, um, if they did not face the potential for emergency security uh, issues, and by the way, the rating agencies never cited a pandemic, they did cite war and the need to borrow in a hurry in that situation, um, Israel has always needed to maintain a lower debt to asset ratio, debt to GDP ratio than other similarly rated uh, countries and pay a little bit higher interest rate. Nonetheless, by Israeli historical standards, by global historical standards, interest rates are quite low uh, for Israel. Thank you, Brian. So I don't know if you saw the polling question answers come up, but uh, it looks like hummus or hummus is the uh, the crowd favorite for favorite Israeli food. Uh, and then 100% uh, of you thought that the Israeli economy would grow faster than the U.S. economy in the coming decade, which uh, which we really love to hear. Uh, and we obviously, as you know, supporters and investors in Israel feel feel similarly. So just uh, thank you so much for spending your time with us today, and I hope you found this helpful. Um, we are here uh, to answer all of your questions. Uh, I'd also invite you, we recently updated our website, uh, which is www.israelinvestmentadvisors.com. There's also an email uh, address for Amy Kaufman uh, at the bottom of the screen. We invite you to get in touch with us. Uh, you can do that there on our website. We'll also be hosting an upcoming webinar uh, in conjunction with the, hopefully I'm saying this right, Brian, is it the American Friends or the Israeli Antiquities Authority? Um, the American which Friends we're excited for that. Antiquity. Yep, uh, and that starts on April 21st. Uh, it's safe to assume if you sign up for our webinar, we will follow up with you uh, with that information as well. Uh, so with that, uh, we hope everyone stays healthy and safe. We thank you for spending some time with us today. Uh, and we hope to see and engage with all of you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.